Welcome to the inaugural Goals-Based Investing Podcast. I'm thrilled today to be joined by my very good friend, John Ersessian. John, welcome. Thanks, Tony. I'm pleased to be here. So, so we're going to talk today about a topic that is near and dear to both of us. Goals-based investing is really kind of premised on the idea that modern portfolio theory has certain flaws and that behavioral finance, something that you and I care deeply about, identifies some of the problems that we know investors and advisors have, but sometimes struggle with. So, so let us dig into this whole notion of behavioral finance, and then more specifically for advisors, how they can become a behavioral coach to help clients through this. So help us with kind of the basics here. What are the basic sort of behavioral biases that we, we see so often in the marketplace? Let's start with that. Uh, so the concept of behavioral science or behavioral finance, Tony, uh, gets to the point that you just made, that in theory, when we examine information and we interpret it rationally, logically, we would, in theory, draw the right conclusions, those conclusions that give us the greatest probability of successful outcomes. That's the way it would probably work if we were robotic. But the truth is we're not. We're human beings. And we're subject to biases, both cognitive and emotional biases, that sometimes cause us to make decisions that are suboptimal. What are some of these biases? We, we see them every day. There's the concept of recency, right? We have a tendency to over allocate money to asset classes that have performed well recently, assuming that that trend will continue. Overconfidence. We all think that we're better at a certain task than we actually are. I exhibit that on the golf course every day. Uh, I take shots that are probably beyond my capabilities, but in the back of my mind, I hope or I assume that I'm capable of executing them. Loss aversion. Right, This whole premise that it hurts more to lose money than it feels good to win a similar amount. And that causes us to do a number of things that are kind of counterproductive. So those are some of the common biases that affect, by the way, Tony, not just investors. We're not intending to be critical yeah. of the retail investor. We're subject to them, too, as financial advisors or professionals. We all have those sort of biases, and uh, you know, it's it's something that I, I think we all struggle with, especially when the markets get volatile. And, and we all we need to do is think back. You know, eighteen months ago, it was clearly a period of time where emotions were driving a lot of behavior rather than logic. If I kind of want to pick up on that loss aversion, though, because I think that's one that is that is so ingrained in what we think about. Um, but a, a friend of mine, I, I got a text message from my friend Samantha this morning, who was reading my book. And she was going through the chapter on behavioral biases. And she said, I don't really understand if we know that all of these exist, if we know that clients exhibit loss aversions and we as investors exhibit loss aversion, why does it persist? W won't we overcome it over time? And I, I had a response, but I'd be curious what your response is to that. Absolutely right. So we've done a lot of reading on the subject in theory, right? We as professionals, obviously your book does a great job of addressing behavioral bias and the valuable role an advisor can play in providing behavioral coaching. But any one of the biases, we read some of the great books that have been written, Nudge by Thaler, or Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman and Tversky. I mean, there's some really great work out there. And so we're aware of its existence in theory. But the, pro the problem is, Tony, we don't make decisions in a vacuum. We make them as emotions are running high. We make decisions during periods of market volatility, and it's the emotional being that kind of gets in the way of rational decision making. I'm curious, what's your interpretation as to why these biases are still present, even though we know they exist? We're emotional beings, and we do respond to that emotional stimuli, even though in the back of our brain, we know it's not the right thing to do. Um, I want to pick up on a point that you made, though, that, that I think is so important. And as I was putting together the book, and, and thank you for all the help, you, you helped frame a lot of the thoughts around this topic in particular. But I was actually uh, reading some research by our friend Julie Littlechild, where she actually studied advisors. And, and her research was actually done in the middle of, of COVID. So it was kind of a real-time sort of examples. And her research, of course, pointed out that advisors often exhibit these behavioral biases. Just like you and I were just talking about, even though they know that it exists, they often do, especially when things feel the most uncomfortable. And... I guess the question I'm going to have is, and, and this is something, you know, which is really the purpose of doing the, the podcast here today is how do we help advisors and how do we help clients 
right? I think so much of the great research that you and I have, you know, read the thought, the Thalers and the Kahnemans and all, that's all theoretical, but you've done a terrific job really helping advisors think through the practical side of it. How do we practically get them to overcome these biases and do a better job preparing clients for the inevitable? And the inevitable is we will have more volatility. Yeah, Tony, well, let's talk about the problem. And then let's talk about some practical solutions that we can uh, provide to both the advisory community and the investor community. So the problem is, is that behavioral bias does get in the way. And, and there have been some great studies done that actually quantify the cost of poor decision-making. You're all familiar with the Dalbar study, investor returns versus investment returns, or for those of us who you know, studied or teach SEMA, it's the time-weighted return versus the dollar-weighted rate of return. It's not a criticism or an indictment of the retail investor. It just is what it is. We have a tendency as investors to underperform the return of the market because we make poor decisions. We wind up over allocating money to markets after they've risen. We wind up abandoning our strategy and withdrawing capital, reducing our risk exposure after periods of market decline. So the problem exists, right? And so the question I think that you're asking is what can an advisor do to help improve outcomes? Well, I am very much a believer that the role of the advisor goes well beyond modern portfolio theory and traditional portfolio construction, evaluating the statistics and the metrics that we often rely upon. There is a huge opportunity for advisors to provide tremendous value through behavioral coaching. Um, let's talk about some of the things that an advisor can do. Number one, we love the idea of keeping things in the right context or perspective. We have a tendency to look at short-term uh, market returns, We've got to remind clients of the probabilities of successful outcomes when they take a longer term view. Second approach is one that you advocate so well in your book, goals-based investing. How about instead of looking at all my resources in aggregate, like in March of 2020, I compartmentalize, if you will, my various financial goals and I immunize them by setting aside certain dollars with a certain risk profile and a certain time horizon, knowing that even if markets exhibit volatility, I've immunized the front end of my liability stream. That allows me to sleep better at night. That allows me to maintain, if you will, a long-term perspective. Another one that I know you wrote about extensively in your book is the idea of developing an appropriate framework, whether it's an IPS formally for an institutional client or even something as simple as an asset allocation or financial plan. Having, if you will, a predetermined approach a methodology, if you will, a, a guidepost that we can refer to during periods of market volatility can help us keep the investor on track. And John, when I was working on the book, you were kind enough to spend a little time and kind of walk me through some of the things that you're experiencing when you're working with advisors. And one of the things that really struck me is the, this whole idea of framing. And in particular, um, asking the right sort of questions, right? So we, we all kind of know that we should be probing to understand the way the clients respond to risk, but I, but I thought you did a really good job of kind of thinking about how to frame the question appropriately and what sort of questions really elicit the right sort of responses. I mean, it's a great technique. I, we don't do it maybe as often as we should or think about it as, um, as often as we should. Stop and think about this, Tony. Let's assume that you and I are of the same age and the same financial condition, but you and I are very different emotional beings. And so the question I would ask is, would an advisor's recommendation be identical given the similarities financially that we exhibit? Or would the advisor incorporate, if you will, our different emotional makeup and frame or present their recommendations to us in a better, more productive manner, recognizing our emotional hot buttons our risk tolerance, our emotional state of being. Framing can go a long way in helping to overcome some of the biases that are exhibited. It, it can work for us and it can work against us. Uh, a successful advisor will incorporate appropriate framing into their recommendations. One of the ways to do that, of course, and you referenced this a moment ago, is by asking the right questions. When you ask the right questions, you demonstrate empathy, you demonstrate professionalism, and, and more importantly, as an advisor, it gives me greater insight. Your responses allow me to understand you a little bit better than simply the financial profile form. Tell me about your past investment experiences. What worked well? What didn't? What's more upsetting to you? Abandoning a strategy that eventually rises or sticking with one that falls in value? It's that fear versus greed component. 
there are a number of questions that you've identified that are in your book that can, I think, really help advisors gain a deeper understanding of their client's emotional state. And I like questions, right? Because I think we learn so much by engaging our clients. First of all, we show empathy, right? We really care about you. We want to understand this as opposed to kind of that cookie cutter questionnaire that everyone falls into. And I've been struck over the years that sometimes advisors are hesitant to use questionnaires with clients. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is a great tool, but you have to listen carefully to how clients respond to it. And I would imagine, you know, in the middle of COVID, we probably had some very different responses than we did when the market was, you know, going through the roof 2009 to 2019. The other way of framing it, which, which I think is interesting, is the data that we use and the way that we present it, not to fool clients, but give them more of a fulsome sort of look of what's going on. And, and in particular, I, I think we need to engage clients and really speak to them about some of the volatility and the risk. You know, let's not surprise them. Let's not have them assume that markets go straight up. I think the better we prepare them for the inevitable, the better we talk to them about, yes, the markets do go down, but that often provides an opportunity to, to rebalance. And in fact, maybe we do better over the long run by having that longer lens. What, what, what are you seeing with your discussions with advisors? Because I know you use some great charts too to kind of elicit the right sort of responses. Yeah, it goes back to your idea of framing, right? So maybe instead of having this client focus, if you will, just on the returns this quarter, this month, or this week, if we can keep things in the right context, that may allow us to engage the clients in a more productive path to, to, to financial success. I, I think a large part of the advisor's role, Tony, is instilling discipline, right? The investing world is undisciplined. Maybe one of our contributions is to provide some guardrails, some methodology, some discipline, that, that prevents the investor from doing things that are counterproductive. I'm a big believer that the greatest cost to today's investor, it's not the 50 basis points a year the, their financial advisor charges them. Their greatest cost often as an investor is the cost of the bad decisions they make in an undisciplined manner. And, and so there are a number of different things that are tried and true that can help investors instill some discipline into their methodologies. Number one is to diversify. Right, diversification implies that I reduce the overall volatility of my portfolio. And when I reduce that volatility, two things happen. Number one, I know that financially I achieve better outcomes, but more importantly, emotionally, I'm less tempted to do something that is foolish. And so risk reduction or volatility reduction through diversification works. And I love your reference to rebalancing because rebalancing forces us to do what is emotionally uncomfortable, but financially productive. I, I mean, stop and think about this, Tony. I have a diversified portfolio. And at the end of the year, given the various returns of my asset classes, what you're advising me to do is to remove money from those that did well and to redeploy that capital into things that did less well. It's kind of, uh, it, it's, it, it's kind of um, uh, counterintuitive. But successful investing often is counterintuitive. Like our friend Ted Lasso once said, if it kind of hurts while you're doing it, you're, you're, you're probably doing it right. <laughs> uh, I, I want to go back on this whole notion of behavioral coaching, which you and I you know, have both spoken and written about quite a bit over the years. Um, and I wonder if, if you think that advisors are really leaning into behavioral coaching. I, I think it's such an important part. And, you know, you, you referenced uh, some of the research that's been done. And I know uh, Vanguard and InvestNet have actually quantified how much of the value of an advisor is really from this behavioral coaching aspect. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm fearful that advisors really aren't building the, this into their value proposition. I mean, I, I think some of the, the better ones do it, but I'm not sure they're calling it out and saying, my value to you is being a behavioral coach. What are you seeing in that regard? And, and do you agree with that? I much agree with your premise that sometimes uh, we take for granted, we assume that the client, maybe the inexperienced or uneducated client, immediately recognizes who we are, what we do, and the value associated with it. And I think that's a mistake. But there are two um, absolutely required characteristics. Number one, competency. Uh, I come to you as my financial advisor because I know you have the intellectual depth and competency. Help me with portfolio construction and tax minimization and retirement distribution and charitable giving and everything else that you bring to the table. 
I expect you to have the knowledge and the competency required to help me and my family make these very important decisions in my life. But there's something else that you have to be good at. In addition to providing the great advice, you have to be able to communicate the value of your advice. One without the other doesn't get me very far. If I'm very competent, but I lack the ability to articulate the benefits of my competency to an investing public, I'm going to do really good work for three people. Uh, the flip side is also true. I can be a great marketer. I, I can be effective in communicating my value. But if the real value doesn't exist, my clients are going to become disappointed. So I'm with you. It it's not just sufficient today to be able to provide the kind of advice that investors seek. You got to be able to communicate it and quantify it. The Vanguard, InvestNet, and Morningstar studies all did that really effectively. They looked at a variety of different functions that the advisor <laughs> plays, from retirement distribution to tax minimization to portfolio construction. And a key contributor, to your point, was the behavioral coaching aspect. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I, I think it's table stakes. All the investment stuff is table stakes. Clients expect that from you. Otherwise, they're going to go to a robo offering. But I think the real differentiator is often going to be that behavioral coaching, being a psychologist, understanding how your clients are wired and all clients are wired differently, and being an educator. I, I, you and I are educators. We've spent our whole career educating both clients and advisors. I think advisors need to lean into that a little bit more and saying, my value is helping you when things feel the most difficult, when things feel the most distraught and out of control is when you, in fact, need my advice the most. And, and I would argue that when we've gone through a period like we've just gone through, advisors should be reminding clients, I helped you through the difficult period of time. Your temptation was head to the sidelines. But by keeping you in that market, look at your portfolio to now. Look at how you're aligned to meet your goals over the long run. So, so John, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Obviously, you've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, I, I think it's really important for advisors and investors to really understand that we are all emotionals. We have this tendency to act on emotions, but you're so right in being disciplined, sticking to it in good time and bad provides the highest likelihood of achieving everyone's goals over the long run. So thank you so much, John. My pleasure, Tony. Thanks so much for having me and congratulations once again for your book. It's a great piece of work. I'm so happy for you.